folks. Um, we're, we're still getting used to, to Facebook Live, but um, I'm Derek Pratt, uh, educator at the Erie Canal Museum, uh, your host for Quarantine Coffee Hours, and I'm happy to introduce my counterpart at the Seward House Museum, Jeff Ludwig. Hi, Derek. Thanks for having me for Coffee Talk. I ran downstairs and I grabbed my favorite coffee mug. You can see it, but it's the Seward House classic yellow mug full of coffee, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, same. This, uh, this should be fun. Oops. I'm sorry. Uh, still messing around with Facebook a little. Yeah. Uh, All good. Glad, glad you, you did the usual tradition of showing off, uh, showing off your coffee mug. I've got mm -hmm. my my recess coffee uh, mug, drinking recess coffee. Remember to buy local and everything, folks. Um, so here we go. Let's talk a little about William Seward and internal improvements. Um, Let's do it. Yeah. Now I know most of our viewers will be like a politician that's not DeWitt Clinton. What? Uh, but uh, William H. Seward is also important in the story of uh, canals and transportation history. Uh, so, Jeff, you want to tell us a little about Seward? Sure. Uh, so, Seward actually does know DeWitt Clinton a little bit. Uh, DeWitt and Clinton probably would have had no idea when a pesky young Seward was bugging him for a political appointment in 1828 that he would one day be eclipsed, I, I would dare say, uh, by William Seward by the mid 19th century. Uh, so, I'm not coming to you live from the Seward House Museum in Auburn. I'm, I'm not speaking to you from, from home, but uh, if, if your listeners uh, haven't been to the Seward House, it's 33 South Street in Auburn. You can go to our website, SewardHouse.org. We're, of course, closed just like you are, looking forward to reopening uh, when we can and when it's safe. Uh, and we interpret uh, the 19th century through a broad lens, that of William H. Seward and his family. Uh, the home was built in 1816. Uh, it's got an incredible collection of original artifacts, uh, a family home from 1816 to 1951, and a museum ever since. So do come visit. That wasn't your question. I'm just shamelessly pitching. Um, so William Seward uh, is a great statesman of the 19th century. Uh, he's a, a New York State Senator uh, in the early 1830s, then will become a New York Governor, late 1830s through the early mid 1840s. A uh, US Senator from New York for two terms, uh, famously runs for president and is defeated uh, by his fellow Republican, Abraham Lincoln, uh, and in a very a divisive uh, season, and would go on quite famously to sort of be the centerpiece of Lincoln's team of rivals cabinet. During the Civil War years, he appoints Seward to be his Secretary of State. Uh, officially, he does a, a fine job of that, uh, keeps the, the rest of the world neutral and out uh, of the Civil War, and unofficially, uh, becomes Lincoln's right hand, close confidant, and, and great friend, uh, consulting and advising on, on all matter of, of domestic policy as, as well as foreign, uh, has a key role to play, for example, in the crafting of the Emancipation Proclamation and its, and its delivery. After the death of Lincoln, and Seward's nearly killed that same night, uh, actually yesterday was the 150th, uh, not, not 150th, 155th uh, anniversary of Lincoln's death, he dies on April 15th, 1865. He and Seward were, were simultaneously attacked on April 14th, 1865. Lincoln uh, dies tragically, Seward survives grievous injuries uh, and completes Lincoln's second term under Andrew Johnson, where he uh, most famously makes his purchase of Alaska, his so-called folly of 1867. That's a nut, uh, Seward in a nutshell for you. Okay, cool. Um... Yeah, it's a fascinating guy, the more I, I look into him. Um, and I would really suggest that people watching uh, check out the Seward House when we get back to normal. I've, I've enjoyed it every time I've went. Um, but, um, so Jeff kindly shared with us an article uh, at the beginning of this week about the Syracuse and Auburn Railroad, um, which as the name implies, connected Syracuse and Auburn. Um, and, um, oh, by the way, if you haven't read the article yet, you can find it in our description of, uh, it's somewhere, depending on where you're watching this from. Um, but anyway, uh, let's talk a little about that. Uh, so the, the Syracuse and Auburn, um, this was one of Seward's 
uh, pet projects, would you say, or? Yeah, so uh, Super has a, has a, it would seem, a, a very direct uh, and uh, simple to understand relationship with internal improvements. He's a Whig, he's a Republican, he's a believer in empowering a strong uh, central state to achieve works of public good that he thinks won't happen otherwise. Uh, he emerges as a statesman uh, in the late 1820s against the backdrop of uh, Jacksonian revolution. Uh, and he's in the opposition. He doesn't think, uh, it, it's sort of in contrast to the Jacksonian impulse, that individual interests should be allowed to run rampant and unfettered uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness that might lead to chaos. Who's gonna build libraries and schools, bridges, canals, and railroads if we don't pool resources and work together for the greater good? And you can read Seward that way, I think, from his uh, gubernatorial period all the way through uh, his time as Secretary of State. He's, he's a, in some sense, a bit of an old Federalist. He wants to uh, empower a strong state and spend public money on these projects and right wrongs like slavery or come out in favor of pro-immigration policies using the state as a cudgel to do that. But if you look back early in Seward's career, he's kind of slippery. Uh, he's, he's sort of back and forth. And a lot of his critics come at him when he's running for governor in 1838, when he's a rising star uh, in the Whig party. He actually does run for governor before he wins. He wins and loses the first time he tries in 1834. And his opponents say, today we might say, you're flip-flopper. Uh, he'd originally been uh, a Jeffersonian Democrat. He uh, subscribed to the Madisonian principles in his words uh, and was sort of seemingly someone who might have been a part of the Regency uh, headed by Martin Van Buren in this state, a major part of the Jacksonian arm in, in New York state politics. He has a change of heart uh, later in the 1820s, but he does go on the record. In the early 1820s, he is harshly critical of DeWitt Clinton's big ditch project. He says, this will ruin New York State. What a terrible idea. It's, it's an extreme venture uh, and New York won't recover. I think it's gonna be a disaster. Uh, is uh, outspoken against some railroad extensions and even the Chenango Canal uh, extension. And his opponents will, will try to tack that onto him. Uh, but like I say, Stewart does has a change of heart. And I think all of us, when we're in our 20s, which is when Stewart enters the political arena, we, we send, tend to be a bit in flux. What do we believe in? What are our principles? What are our convictions? Do we align with the, one of the two major parties? Are we independent? Uh, and Seward has something of a revelation, and it comes through uh, his ties with John Quincy Adams, who runs for president in 1824 and 28, wins the first time, and loses the second time. And Seward will become much enamored of Adams, uh, writes a biography of him, becomes a political protege of sorts, greatly admires Adams, and will carry on the reformer impulse, uh, the, the anti-slavery sentiments of, of Adams. Uh, and that's when he really becomes what will be a, a Whig Republican, an internal improvements, big government guy, if you will. Uh, and so in 1828, he's got to figure out his political convictions and his political persuasion and where he hopes his ambition will carry him. He's 27 years old, born in 1801, lawyer, living in Auburn, a nice old house, 33 South Street. Um, and he actually goes to uh, Albany and he petitions DeWitt Clinton, whose big ditch has been a big success, it's done now. And he asks him for a political appointment to be a surrogate for Cuba County. Uh, and Clinton says, sure, uh, but I need something from you. Uh, he uh, ha has to make a choice in the 1828 election. Is he going to be supportive of, of Jackson or Quincy Adams in a rematch election? And he's going to come out in favor of Adams. Uh, I'm sorry, in favor of Jackson. He wants Seward to do the same thing. And Seward's not prepared to do that uh, and was going to lose this appointment. In fact, he does. Uh, then Clinton dies and the die is cast. Seward's political career is sort of set. He'll identify with Whig principles, Republican principles, big government principles, uh, and then from there on, be more on the side of expanding big projects, canals and railroads and that sort of thing, highways. Wow. Eric, I give long answers to questions. That's you should fine. cut me off anytime you want to. Hey, no, that was very interesting. Problem. I did not know all that, but man, we hit all the major players of that time period, really, especially uh, Adams. Uh, did, did Seward, I assume he continued working with Adams closely after uh, words? 
Yeah, Adams comes to Auburn. Uh, Adams, sort of, I think, sees in Seward something of a political heir to his legacy. So there's a long-standing relationship between John Quincy Adams and Seward. And Seward will elevate uh, Adams' son, Charles Francis Adams, uh, during the Lincoln administration to be his ambassador to the court of St. James uh, in England. Uh, and so Seward is sort of entangled and involved with uh, both the older and the younger generation of, of Adamses. Hmm. Wow, that's that's pretty neat. Didn't... It's pretty cool. We're in uh, a small world in the 19th century. Yeah, the canal yeah. certainly helped make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, well, I, I guess so. You know, always helps to be rich in America for the Adamses. <laughs> that's that's true. Um, but it is now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so that brings us up to about. The beginning of uh, of Seward's career there sounds like um, yeah. So I think it does. So he doesn't get that appointment in eighteen twenty eight. He considers running for Congress and, and abstains. Uh, he'll run for a state senate seat in eighteen thirty and win it. Serve until eighteen thirty four. Then, as I mentioned, he'll lose gubernatorial race in eighteen thirty four. At this point, I'm sorry. What's that? In Auburn, representing Auburn at this point, or uh, Auburn and Keyes County and, and surrounding counties. Um, then uh, runs for governor, loses in 34, runs and wins in 38, serves two terms, uh, and then retires uh, for a little while, back into, in, retires in his 40s, uh, from public life to private life, practices law again, and then in 1849 through 1861, U.S. Senator from New York, and then, of course, Secretary of State from 61 to 69. But this, this Auburn Syracuse Railroad sort of shows us Seward uh, on the ascent, uh, it, the, the genesis of the project, ties to his uh, state senate career and its completion uh, and growth to his uh, gubernatorial career and then its uh, incorporation into the New York Central in 1853, I think, uh, that happens uh, during Seward's senate career when he becomes a major apostle and advocate for railroad expansion. And if you're, people who are listening who read the essay, one of the, one of the pictures we included on it it was a very small essay, and we're grateful to OHA, Onondaga Historical Association, for letting us share it with you. It was a one-page essay for their, their magazine. Uh, we have a picture of the golden ring on display at the Seward House Museum, cast from the Golden Railroad Spike, given to Seward in honor of a career spent championing the growth and spread of, of rail. And this is one of the earliest examples of that. Happy to talk about it, Derek, to the extent that you want me to. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the the Syracuse and Auburn specifically. Um, so that's the first uh, railroad to enter Syracuse, I believe. Um, it's not even, they, doesn't sorry. even have a mention on it, correct? It's, I'm sorry, would you repeat that? It, I'll doesn't, be quiet. it doesn't even have a steam engine on it, correct? It's, yeah. No. Uh, so the article I have sort of begins with triumphant Governor Seward in 1839 riding in on a power locomotion, a lo locomotive, uh, but the railroad is originally powered by horses. People were disappointed when they, they took their first ride in it. Uh, so the story begins really uh, even before uh, the incorporation of the railroad in 1834. Uh, Syracuse uh, and Auburn were, were roughly equivalent cities, villages uh, in the 18 teens until about 1820. Uh, but the Erie Canal, as you know very well from working in the Waylock building, runs right through the middle of the city, linking it in, networking it to cities east and west and, and propelling its growth. Uh, the canal bypasses Auburn, about 15 miles north of, a, of the city of Auburn. Uh, and so Auburn begins relative to Syracuse to, to, to shrink in size, or at least not grow at the same level. Uh, and so uh, the, the village, the city, uh, elders are, are concerned about this uh, and there's talk of building a rail line to Port Byron to connect it to the canal, or maybe one to Syracuse, which has uh, got the advantage of having the canal and it's a major driver uh, in large growing city in, in central New York or the Wild West, as, as this would have seemed to many in 1828. Um, and so Senator Seward actually will, he's, he's a candidate for governor, will as the presumptive Whig nominee lobby for its incorporation. They get $400,000 and they begin work surveying and leveling. It's about 26 total miles, originally all wood, uh, pine, uh, Norwegian pine, yellow pine, uh, at millions uh, of, of um, what do they call it? 
I forget now, a uh, track board or something like that. I'm not a railroad expert. Right. Uh, it's, it's quite an undertaking. So they take a northeasterly direction. There will be stops in uh, Elbridge, uh, Geddes. I live in Marcellus, and about two miles north of us is Martisco Station, which is worth a visit. And um, one of the trickiest parts was when the rail line met Nine Mile Creek. Uh, what do you do? Do you go over it? Do you build a fill? Uh, and they, this was the biggest, the most difficult part of the project, a 700 foot embankment and bridge work and archways. And you get a sense of that when you, when you travel through that country uh, today. Uh, and eventually comes out not that far from you guys. Um, they built the depot in Syracuse, uh, not far from the canal uh, center. And um, uh, it, took, it took years, it, it overcame financial recessions. They had to get state loans, uh, private investors had to be found. Uh, to sort of buy in after the charter had been issued. Yeah. And the earliest during, ride to, during the panic of uh, 1837, right? Right. They, they kept going. They were too far in uh, to quit. And this is when canals, as you know, Derek, start to see issues too uh, with their upkeep and maintenance by the late 1830s, early 1840s. All these expansion canals and feeder canals and the main line, uh, they're, they're, they're very costly to keep up. Uh, at this point, the, the state's too far in. Seward becomes governor uh, in the midst of this. Uh, the first uh, ride uh, is Christmas, 1837. And people were disappointed. Like I said, it was stagecoaches on cars pulled by teams of horses. They could fit about 20 in a car. These were open air. Uh, people remarked more. It was a beautiful ride. It took three to four hours to get from Syracuse to Auburn on it. Um, and they cut you through beautiful farm country and around Nine Mile Creek and you'd see animals in the forest and, and a farm, you cut through farmlands and see farm animals. Uh, so for the first two years, it was, it was all wooden, it was horsepower. And then the locomotion that I have in my article, Seward riding in on for the first time, the Syracuse, there were three, the Syracuse, the Auburn and the Cayuga, uh, that kind of more modernized rail service begins uh, with my article in, in the summer of 1839. Uh, and this really does modernize and make it seem like a real railroad. It's hard to picture a wooden railroad and uh, horses, no, no, no steam, uh, no engine. Uh, but that's all fixed by, by it's, it's all set by 1839. And it cuts down traffic. I was thinking to myself today, so it took an hour and about eight minutes uh, to get from Syracuse to Auburn or Auburn to Syracuse, depending on which way you're going, five trains a day uh, at the height of the service and freight end and um, commuter traffic. Right. 108 minutes, I'm sorry, an hour and eight minutes, and that built in about 20, 25 minutes for stopping at all the towns along the way. To drive from, from the Erie Canal Museum to Seward House today takes 40, 45 minutes. So it's roughly equivalent of what it takes to drive from Center City, Syracuse to downtown Auburn. Uh, so pretty good. Uh, and We're off today. Yeah, right? It sounds good now we do it. Uh, service continues, uh, and then, as I say, in the 1850s, uh, it it's becomes a link in the Great Chain. Syracuse starts connecting eastwards, Syracuse and Utica Rail, uh, Auburn and Rochester, and they'll all become part of the great network of rails, the New York Central in the 1850s. As a governor, Seward is all about this. He proposes building a northern, central, and southern line. He wants all of New York to be interconnected through rail, through canal, improving the roads, uh, and this is sort of the, it's hard to, 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 to sort of sell a story of internal improvements as exciting and riveting history, but it was vital yeah. to the growth of our region, commerce, movement of people and ideas. And that's the great story that you tell at the Canal Museum, interpreting movements of more than just stuff, but everything else that comes along for the ride. Yeah, but the stuff helps too. You stuff helps. Help you need that. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so does... I assume Auburn starts to, you were saying it was starting to miss out on kind of this growth that was happening in New York and Auburn, I assume, benefited greatly from this new transportation line, right? Yeah, uh, it, it was probably more advantageous to Auburn than to Syracuse. Auburn needed Syracuse a little bit more than Syracuse needed Auburn, but uh, flow of goods, uh, hold a lot of freight, things that were being manufactured in Auburn now could get uh, to Syracuse and then uh, via rail or canal around the country. So it empowers sort of a, a nice industrial uh, boom in Auburn, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s. There's all sorts of interesting financial players, Wells and Fargo. Uh, and so things travel beyond stuff too. You may be traveling with, with money and exchanges um, and credit lines and specie. 
So uh, it definitely links Auburn into a growing market economy in the early Republic. Yeah, that's, yeah, an interesting little beginning to uh, railroads. So Seward, um, he started, he's on the ascendancy in these late 1830s. And as we're talking about here, railroads are also starting to come onto the scene. But what was Seward's relationship with the other great transportation network that we love here at the Erie Canal Museum, uh, Canals? Yeah, so see, he does, uh, he's a proponent of canals. He has to sort of overcome that he'd been an original opponent to the Erie Canal, to the feeder canals. Uh, you can pick up any Seward biography. I've got, I've got the three most recent ones here. And you find uh, by his time in governor, he's completely reversed position. He is all in on canals. The, the, the expense is worth it. These are, these are public investments, he says. These are for the greater good. Uh, so trains will sort of maybe surpass canals by the 1840s, 1850s, sort of the apple of his eye and the likes of Stephen Douglas and others. Uh, but the, the canal's been done. It was a major accomplishment. Uh, and he's committed to being a steward of it, to seeing its, its upkeep. Um, people criticized him for spending money that they didn't have on it, but uh, he considered the canal an investment that had to be maintained and, and grown. And during his two terms, he found a lot of monies into the canal. Right, uh, but also during Seward's term, uh, isn't that also when stop and tax happens? We could. Ooh, you got me there. I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, 1842, uh, the state of New York uh, issues the stop and tax bill, which well, law says you have to so stop. So that's, that's for canal boats? They'd stop and... But no, they, uh, they were enlarging the canal um, and thanks to the panic of 1837 and everything, they stopped. And I mean, and the, the state's involved, I think it gets like 45 cents of every dollar in toll for freight on the Auburn and Syracuse rails. Oh. Um, and I think there's, there's research to be done. There'd be a good article, and maybe this is the time for, for, for one of us to do it, yeah. on Seward and Canals. His career is so big. Uh, one of the things that I've found uh, in reading Seward biographies or, or a great book like Team of Rivals is that there's, there's almost so much to Seward. Our house tagline is one house, many stories. Uh, and there's such great interest among historical readers to get to the Civil War or to cover the, 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 the coming of Civil War that often in the course of, of the historiography or the scholarship of Seward, I think his gubernatorial career gets uh, short shrift. Uh, in fact, uh, Zach Finn, who works at the museum with me in education, has been working on a great article on Governor Seward. I mean, he's the first Whig governor in New York's history. It's a big deal. He's young, he's 38, and his 11 predecessors have all been the Democratic Republicans, or Democrats. Uh, and so he is the first one to advance a, a, a true Whig Republican vision of let's grow the state for the, for the public good. Uh, and he does a lot during this time. He conducts a great series of surveys. This is what Zach's been writing about on the natural history of New York. He's, uh, he's investing heavily, of course, in infrastructure, internal improvements. He's also building up uh, a, a, a educational infrastructure, uh, creating thousands of school district libraries and working on school reform. As governor, the seeds of the stuff that the historians really, really, really want to get to when it comes to Seward, which is, of course, slavery uh, and his anti-slavery position, the fact that the Seward House Museum was a stop on the under the Seward House was a stop on the Underground Railroad, uh, that he's a, a zealous anti-slavery voice of the 1850s. Uh, this emerges during his time as governor of New York too. Uh, Seward doesn't have to as governor deal with the issue of slavery in New York any longer. As you know, a gradual emancipation laws took effect in New York State and slavery was ended uh, by the late 1820s. That's not to say that slavery doesn't touch on every facet of New York life uh, and that uh, there's still trafficking. Uh, and what happens when uh, enslaved persons escape to freedom in New York? As Governor Seward uh, sought to protect them, he uh, appointed New York attorneys general uh, to represent their interesting claims in court, refusing to return what was considered the, the property of Southern enslavers. Uh, it, he backs powerful progressive legislation pro-immigration, anti-slavery, and the anti-slavery one. He empowers the New York State Agency, so, so building up the power of the state to investigate claims that freeborn New Yorkers of color are being kidnapped from freedom into slavery. 
has actually happened to no less a person during Seward's governorship than Solomon Northrop, uh, who's stolen away and, and sent to slavery, a freeborn New Yorker of color. His eventual release secured by that Seward backed legislation he would return to New York and publish uh, 12 Years a Slave right, right in Auburn at the Derby and Miller uh, publishing shop. Oh, that's great. Uh, so th when you think of like the, ex the expanding role of the state in Seward's mind, canals are, are a big part of it and so is everything else. And I think that so much of what we think about with William Seward tends to sort of blur into his national career as a Senator, as Secretary of State, but we can actually see the seed time for that as governor. Unfortunately, one of the casualties often in scholarship of Seward is because you want to follow these 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 plot points from from origin to conclusion. Uh, the canals tend to to get less attention. You can read all the Seward biographies; you'll get your paragraph about canals. But then there's a good article to be written uh, on the relationship between Seward and canals. Maybe someone who's watching this right now has got time on their hands at home and uh, historically inclined wants to do that work for us, Derek. Yeah, that would be great. Anybody out there, you know, we're, we're happy to take your articles. Um, but um, it's interesting. Um, so everybody, like you talked about, they think of Seward kind of in this uh, context of uh, slavery and the Civil War and everything. But um, I, I recently did a video for the Seward House members. You should get a membership to the Seward House. Uh, yeah. <laughs> talking about how, um, thank you. Andrew, I see in the comments saying I should write the article, maybe one day. Uh, but um, the internal improvement issue and slavery actually get kind of mixed up together, right? Uh, right. Does the state have the right to do this? This is, this is in, in some cases, an issue of, of, of property rights. Uh, and what trumps what? Uh, the, the power of the state to promote the social good or the individual's right to life, liberty, and pursuit of, and pursuit of happiness? This is the Jacksonian divide. It's, is individualism the, the stronger thread, or is it sort of the, the greater good of the, of the community? Uh, and we see these tension points come up again and again in the way uh, the debates around whether it's justifiable to tax. Seward's often vilified as someone who's a lot like old King George, overtaxing the poor people of New York and wasting their money on frivolous projects. I know what's best for me and my money, and I don't want the state taking it out of my pocket so much government waste that now I'm putting a bit of a modern spin on it. But those are, that's not actually that new or modern a mode of discourse. Seward faced charges of, of being, we might say, a tax and spender. Uh, uh, but they had to justify this. Does the state have a right to intercede uh, on what one considers to be their private property? And it's not that far a leap to take that from taxes. Uh, to something as, as, as fraught as, as slavery. In fact, when uh, Lincoln and Seward are debating uh, the, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, which will be followed by the 13th Amendment, because of course the proclamation frees slaves in the rebelling territories, but not in um, uh, Union slave states like, uh, like Maryland, like Missouri. Um, very carefully crafted to avoid alienating those, the, pro-union slave states, uh, did he have the constitutional authority? Would this hold up in the Supreme Court? Uh, this was a big, dramatic, seismic shift in our understanding of, of, of American law. And that was something that Seward and Lincoln as lawyers figured out together. Yes, we do have the right to do this. And, uh, but this is all a part of sort of the bigger uh, backdrop of, of how do you understand, debate, and affect change in a society like the United States. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so we talked. You talked about how Seward uh, he's working with Lincoln and everything um, in the the Lincoln administration. Uh, what was he doing to further the cause of, and even maybe before when he was a senator as well, um, to further the internal improvement uh, debate? So it's all about railroads. Uh, um, having East meet West, uh, even if that means that the the government has to help out because. Again, uh, eventually, you know, private corporations, private railroad companies will, will, uh, will do a lot of the work, but, but sometimes they wouldn't, and getting things started connecting all communities and all peoples. Uh, Lincoln and Seward kind of had that in common. I gave a talk last week, and anybody who wants to go to the Seward House Facebook can, can watch the archive of talks. We're also doing them on Thursdays 
In fact, I have one I'm doing at noon today. So if you've got lunchtime free, you can log into our Facebook page and hear some more steward conversation. Well, actually, uh, in our, our Facebook comments here on the video. So. Oh, good, good. Uh, I, I, I talked last time about uh, Lincoln and Stewart and Lincoln's dream for himself rising up uh, in, the, in the Illinois. I don't say Illinois, Illinois. I said it wrong in my talk. Uh, Illinois legislature, his dream was to be the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois. Uh, and they both have that in common. Of course, uh, Lincoln's uh, hope to be a senator is undone by Stephen Douglas, a little giant who's a great and avid promoter of railroads. But throughout the 1850s, it's so easy to overlook because this is the decade of sort of prelude to war. And you read back through it from the beginning. Uh, Seward's first major address isn't about railroads or canals. It's, it's about a higher law, talking about admitting California as a, as a free state, uh, challenging the legitimacy of the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, arguing, as he will in one speech in 1848, that slavery can be abolished and we must do it. That's so dramatic. Uh, but, you know, the Civil War wouldn't have been the war that we know it had it not been for railroads, uh, internal improvements. And northern states, uh, with, with uh, leaders like Seward, Lincoln at the helm, had stronger infrastructure, bigger, uh, more activist states, uh, and how much of the Civil War is a history of, of economy, uh, supply lines, and the movement of peoples and goods to where they were needed, and not for nothing that uh, it's supply lines that are often attacked. Uh, it's, it's of vital importance. You've got to move your army. You've got to feed your army. Uh, Seward's son, William Jr., actually after he's injured in the war, he's sent to Martinsburg, West Virginia, to guard a depot. Uh, so uh, throughout the 1850s, if you look closely for it, you can find the story of Seward working on behalf of internal improvements. He, Lincoln, uh, one of his political idols, where Seward was John Quincy Adams, his was, was Henry Clay. They both admire the father of the American system, though there's an estrangement that takes place during the 1850s because, of course, Clay is a compromiser. Clay is the author of uh, Compromise of 1850, the Missouri Compromise before that. So everything kind of gets tangled up together and it's hard to separate threads as uh, the country polarizes in the 1850s. So there are good stories that we could talk about of Seward and Railroads and, and uh, listeners can go to the books. Uh, it's almost easier to read a history of railroads and find Seward, Lincoln, and, and our characters in those books. And there's some great books. Uh, William White, a uh, great historian, has a great book on railroads called Railroaded. Um, to, to sort of go in through that lens, then to go to your traditional sources for Seward uh, and find the great coverage of railroads you're looking for, because there's just so much oxygen being taken out of the room with the, the debates and the fights over slavery. Yeah, that, that makes uh, total sense uh, there. Um, I had found it interesting you said uh, Stephen Douglas, a uh, notable Democrat um, at that time, was a heavy promoter of railroads. Uh, by the Civil War era, were we starting to see a shift in the kind of national politics? Because you'd identified Whigs almost as... Right. Well, you've got your Northern Democrats, right? And your Southern Democrats, which are different things, which is why in 1860, after Seward loses to Lincoln, Lincoln wins the Republican nomination. It's a four-way race for the presidency. There are four major parties. Lincoln only wins with the plurality of the vote, like 40, 41, 42 percent. So there's your Northern Democrats, your Southern Democrats. There really are no Southern Republicans. Uh, and the country is sort of fractured. So, yes... Uh, but I think regionally, uh, party labels and platforms meant different things. And it was hard to keep a party like the Democratic Party, which is really the majority party of the country, from Jefferson through Lincoln, uh, uh, under one tent. There are little instances of, of a break, someone like uh, Zachary Taylor. Um, but by and large, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a Democratic reign, uh, 1800 to 1865. Uh, and of course, that, that meant a big party that was changing and evolving. And I think that could be the subject of a whole other coffee talk. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, very true. Uh, yeah. And so I assume 
Seward plays a big part in the Transcontinental Railroad as well. He has the uh, ring that you talked about and everything. Yeah, uh, he, he was a, a consistent supporter of it uh, through its conclusion. So Seward um, retires, not, not necessarily by choice, in March of 1869. He'd uh, been appointed by Lincoln in the winter, secession winter of 1861. And Seward, the 24th Secretary of State in the history of the office, it's third longest tenured, it's first to go abroad, pretty active. He's involved, he's always sort of running afoul of other colleagues uh, in uh, the president's cabinet because he's overstepping. But it's not really his business as Secretary of State to be meddling with the Navy, and he does that. Gideon Wells is constantly frustrated. And Lincoln lets him do it. Uh, or dealing with these sort of great domestic projects. Um, but he does. Uh, and an advocate for the Transcontinental Railroad, in fact. So he, um, he retires in March of 1869. Uh, the Johnson presidency is sort of ended in a whimper after, after impeachment scandal. Uh, Grant, coming in a Republican like Seward, and Seward's rather hopeful Grant might keep him on. Grant wants a clean break from what's come before. He's gotten dragged in to the Edwin Stanton unpleasantness, the Secretary of War, the sort of cause of, uh, ostensible cause of the, the impeachment charges. Um, so Seward goes home to Auburn in March of 1869. Grant brings a new team in. Uh, but just two months later, uh, East meets West in, uh, in Utah. Uh, and Seward is one of four uh, men honored with a golden ring. Grant's another one, railroad company president. Actually, there were five uh, and a master of ceremonies. I believe one of these rings is actually on display. If anyone goes out this summer to the Adirondacks at the Adirondack Experience Museum. Uh, and um, anyway, lifetime pass to ride the rails, and that's what he'll do. He, uh, that summer of 1869, he goes all the way to California, the, the great dream of, of going west with ease and convenience, uh, stops along the way and, and sees the country, uh, and really takes advantage. And it's sort of a culmination for him of a belief this was, this was something to be nurtured, cultivated, grown, supported all the way back from, you might say, around the birth of his career, 1830 through 1869. So from half a century, it used to take Seward an entire night's ride from Geneva to Rochester to go 40 miles. Uh, and by the time he retired, he could get to California uh, in days uh, with stops along the way and taking his time. So what a, what a sea change from a person born during the early months of the Jefferson administration to someone who dies uh, during the time of Grant to see the, the whole country and the whole world open up before him. And it's all a result of these internal improvements. He's also a supporter of, of um, transatlantic, trans-Pacific uh, shipping uh, and, and charters. So it's sea travel as well on the seas as, as well as in the canals. Uh, there's sort of a big broad umbrella for Seward and internal improvements. Well, there, there we go. There we go. Got a lot to do with Internal and external improvements. Great. Um, well, uh, I think on that note, we've had a, a pretty good talk here. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please try to pop them into our, our comments now. Um, we'll give you folks a minute to maybe ask yeah. questions. And uh, I'll say, uh, tune in. You've got, you've got an hour and 15 minutes to get yourself some lunch or something so you can tune in to uh, Jeff's lunchtime lecture uh, at noon on the Seward Houses page. What's the subject again? Uh, it, so today's talk, I'm calling it Seward in Love. I'm going to talk about changing uh, conceptions of, of romance and individual choice uh, in Seward's youth uh, from a time in which all that was pretty much prescribed. Your, your parents, your family, they pretty much told you and, and uh, how it was going to work. You had to have great family buy-in and you deferred to uh, the authority of the patriarch, uh, to like individuals making romantic choices based on sentiment and emotion. Uh, and this age of romanticism blossoming during Seward's time, love letter writing and, and openly speaking of feelings, all this is pretty new. So I'm gonna look at changes in romantic understandings and concepts through Seward. Uh, have a little fun digging, poking into his dating history uh, and then his courtship with his eventual wife, who was the young woman who grew up, at what we know at the Seward House Museum, he moves into her dad's house. Uh, and then look at their love letters uh, over the years, because one of the costs of this long career of Seward's we've talked about today, 1830 to 69, with some breaks, uh, is that he's not home very much. 
Uh, and, and Francis, who I, I love to talk about, Mrs. Seward, Francis Seward, uh, was rarely with him, though she was a political radical, astute, uh, really responsible for the Seward house being a stop on the Underground Railroad, and critic of her husband when he would drift into compromise. Uh, their marriage was conducted through the mails, through correspondence. They're often apart, so parsing some of their love letters uh, to, to sort of fit them into that context and get to know them a little better by peeking into their mail. Okay, interesting. I'm, I'm sure railroads and canals really play heavily in those love letters. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna talk a lot about freight, <laughs> tonnage. <laughs> yep, T toll, taxes and all that, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not seeing anything in the comments, um, but thank you, Jeff, this has been great. Um, and talk tomorrow. I mean, yeah. later today it sounds very interesting. So, And thanks so much for having me on. Uh, shameless plug. Uh, it's important during times like these, we're all staying home. Museums are still doing work. And, and uh, if, if you can, if you haven't renewed your membership to the Erie Canal Museum, I just did last week. Uh, please do that. Help out. Uh, these, these institutions need your support now more than ever. The same is true of the Seward House Museum. If you've liked today's talk, check us out on Facebook. Maybe consider opening up a membership or plan a visit and see what we've got to offer uh, just as soon as we can open back up. Yeah. All right. I ditto. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Derek. I'm looking forward to talking to you again soon and seeing you in person when this is over. Yes, same. Yeah. I got to get out to Auburn soon. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you.